our imaginations, all our inclinations, and all our actions, and let them be directed to what you have to say to your people in terms of the incredible offer of a gift that would not only last a lifetime, but a gift that we shall carry now and forevermore. And so what is this gift? The gift of God. Speak to us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. The gift is joy. I will teach you a scripture reference that I hope you would not only memorize, but take to heart. And it's easy to remember the reference because it's one, two, three. Say with me, Isaiah 12, three. Isaiah 1, 2, 3. Isaiah 12, 3. So that's easy. And you know why Isaiah uh, happens to be my favorite major prophet? Because Isaiah is kind of like very aggressive when it comes to the Word of God. He always would end it. Thus saith the Lord. And so here is the scripture passage that I'd like for you not only to think through, memorize, but actually to imbibe, to experience. It begins this way. David is very good with action, uh, 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 you know, supplements, and I will do the same. The first line is this. Say, Isaiah 12, 3. Isaiah 12, 3. With joy. See, did you see how you catch it and then you put it in your heart? Say, with joy. With joy. That's the first line. Can you memorize that? With joy. With joy. You will draw water. With joy, you will draw water. Draw like from the well. Oh, maybe there's a better version. Draw water. This <laughs> is supposed to drink. Let's repeat it. Isaiah 12, 3. With joy, you will draw water. That's better. Don't spill it. And the final line. So, so far in God, with joy, you will draw water. The last one. From the wells of salvation. So, here it goes. From the wells of salvation. We turn it up. From the wells of salvation. So, it's not from the wells of earth, but from the wells of salvation. You got that? Are we ready? I say... 12, 3. With joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. All right, now only you. And I say, one, two, ready, go. Say it with action. Let me see if, if you got it. One, two, three. I say
after joy, after joy. Let's see, let, let's see if it works. Isaiah was certainly up to something when he said, it is with joy. That's very difficult to define, right? But Because it's not human made. It is with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. What he's trying to say is this. Humans were designed to experience sustained joy. Every human being, listen, by design, we were designed to experience sustained joy. Now my question is, why is there a terrible lack of joyful manifestation in the world where I live in? There's a lot of giggling, to be sure. There's a lot of cheap laughter. But not joy. Because joy, if I know, if I, if, if I am discerning it correctly, it's, it's not human made. But it's divine. But you know it when it's in front of you. What's being said from the scripture that you just rehearsed is this. Joy, actually, is like drawn water. You will have to participate in the drawing of it. But make no mistake, it is not sourced from any earthly sister. It is not sourced from any earthly well. There's nothing in this world that can offer you joy. Nothing. If you're going to experience joy first you will have to participate in in the, the the drawing of it but then it has to come from the incredible indescribable wells of salvation oh that's kind of like tricky because what that sounds so like out of this world so what kind of a well are you talking about because i say uh, seems to be so sure that I have this secret recipe, people. You were crafted for joy. And it is God's will for you to experience joy. Joy, joy, joy. And Jesus calls that abundant life, by the way. And get this. You have to participate by drawing water from the incredible source of the wells of salvation. If I'm reading this correctly, people, let's not beat around the bush. The wells of salvation is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And at the very heart of the gospel of Jesus Christ is the pearl of a great price, the Lord Jesus himself. That is the centrality of the gospel. It is not a set of ideas. It is not a set of theological preposition. It is the person of the Son of God. That is the central message of the gospel. It is unlike any other movement or any other religion where you are given a set of moral do's and don'ts and then you will be blessed. Christianity is set apart because you are introduced to a person and you are invited to know a person. And the deal is this. Once you turn your life over completely to that person and, and, and surrender your life to him and you call him your Lord, your Savior, your Redeemer, then you get the gospel. Now what movement and what religion do you have that would compare to that? None. Because only Christianity puts a person as the central, the central, most important pearl. Jesus. That's why it's different. <clears throat> but then, where is Jesus? He is now seated at the right hand of the Father. And technically, when I ask you where is Jesus, and a lot of you say Jesus is in my heart, I know it's true. Positionally, 
technically our own work. Jesus is seated right now mm -hmm. at the right hand of the Father. But why are you saying that Jesus is in your heart? You know why you're saying that? Because really someone is inside, living within you. That's the part of Labels. That's the comfort. That's the one Jesus promised that will be with you and will never depart from you, will guide you and instruct you in all things. That's the Holy Spirit, the part of Labels. And if you read scriptures, you will know that any reference to the living well or any reference of that sort that applies to the quenching of the thirst is constantly in reference to the movement of the Spirit of the living God. When Jesus said to his followers, do not be sad because I'm going to be with my Father, but I will never leave you like orphans. I will leave you the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. He will walk alongside you, He will comfort you, and He will guide you and instruct you in all things. The Penuma, the Holy Spirit. And that's the reason why when we do some things that are not pleasing in the eyes of God, the Holy Spirit weeps and is quenched. Did you see that? There's thirstiness. Do not quench the Spirit. Because the analogy is this. The Holy Spirit and water. That's the well of salvation. It speaks of living water. We are a human uh, population. No humans can live without water. It's a perfect analogy of human thirst. But there's a deeper thirst, a, a deeper spiritual thirst. We were given this thirstiness. Because God wants for us not to forget that we need the wells of salvation. We need the water of God, the bubbling up of His presence in our lives. If you do not have the bubbling up of God's presence in your life, and you do not have the sense that you are being guided and instructed by God who lives inside, your life will be without joy. Period. And Jeremiah was on point when he said, the problem with you people is that you do not. You ignore the fountain of living waters. You are looking at stagnant waters and you're trading your stagnant waters for the running springs. You have broken cisterns that cannot hold water. That's Jeremiah 2.13. Jeremiah was so on point. Humans, the problem with human beings today is they're very thirsty and they source out their thirst and looking for some human wells, career, relationship. You think you can find it in, in some man-made association and in good works even. Charity probably will give me this, this satisfaction of my thirst. And, and there's none. Because I think the prophets get it. Jeremiah said, why are you trading the living water with stagnant sources? And then Jesus comes into the picture and provides an amazing explanation to what this joy is all about. With joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Who offers salvation anyway? Who is the only one? There is no name given to men in heaven and on earth. No other name except the one name, Jesus, who provides salvation for all men. That is just so crystal clear. And that is the reason why the simple premise of our word today is this. 
If your life is joyless, there is only one reason for that. You're probably ignoring the most important truth about you. That God resides inside. That He's actually crying and weeping right now. If you're not living the centrality of the gospel, then you're not sharing what you have. The greatest thing about you is that Jesus redeemed you. He saved you. He gave you life eternal and you're keeping it to yourself. That's not the way it ought to be. This is the only gift that's meant to be regifted. Salvation. That's why it's called the wells of salvation. Because it keeps on being shared to other people. And so this morning we've been talking about the need to share your faith. You got it. If you're joyless, it's most probably because you have not shared your faith to someone else recently. Maybe the last time you shared it was probably five years ago. And you think North America is a scary place where you cannot share because there's a lot of prohibitions. And so you stop. You have your own rationalizations perhaps on why you stop sharing. Maybe you have your own version. But let's look at the version of God and see. At the end of our time together, I hope you can wait to get out of those doors and, and ask God for an opportunity to speak and tell your simple story on what God is doing in your life. And hope that those who listen would experience the wells of salvation that's bubbling up in your life. That's my prayer. Because my prayer is that there is not going to be one person here left without joy. The first thing that we'd like to look at in John chapter 4 is when God, through Jesus Christ, provides how to share faith. He does it intentionally. I get it. You have to participate. What you mean by intentionality is this. God provides the opportunity, but you play your part. You actually plan. So there's an intentionality. If you call yourselves Christians, followers of Jesus, there has to be a strong commitment towards intentionality. The question is, when was the last time that you actually intentionally sought out to share a story about God in your life? That's the question. Because if you have not done that recently, that probably explains why there seems to be some static in the quality point index of our joyless existence. You're not supposed to be joyless. You're supposed to be a PowerPoint presentation of a bubbling brook, of a person who has joy in the Lord. And so what do we have here? Intentionality. The Lord Jesus was traveling and he had to pass through Samaria. Now contextually from where Jesus was traveling, uh, from Judea, he left Judea and went back towards Galilee, but in between those two locations was a a place that was like don't pass this way place, Samaria. But Jesus passed anyway. The Jews and the Samaritans do not negotiate. They do not talk to each other. There is a sharp divide, a clear racial divide, not only racial but religious divide between the Jews and the Samaritans. And so you just avoid passing by Samaria, but not Jesus. Because we find here that Jesus is really intentional. So amazing. He walks right into Samaria 
and then he sits because he got tired at noon time he sits on a well now the well was described not an ordinary well this connects us to genesis it is the well of jacob the well that jacob gave to joseph by the way why did god protect joseph jacob and the entire family because of the promised seed let me ask you a question who was sitting on the well the promised seed did you get the connection this is incredible this is an incredible connection and they're talking about the well they're talking about water i'd like for you to keep that in mind and so jesus was thirsty and while he was thirsty if if jesus is god he knew it was going to come out at noon time no one draws water from the well because if you know your um, your uh, contextual geography no one does that in this part of the world because it's too hot for them water is precious but it's just too hot at noon time so they they draw water from the well early in the morning but for them water is like a gift from god because they're very thirsty all the time because it's too hot remember this all kinds of things going on in the context to it and so jesus was sitting and here comes a samaritan woman remember men do not talk to women publicly in ancient near eastern world no no remember jews do not talk to samaritans in the in the time of jesus so no no no, no. and if you read and if you're familiar with the samaritan woman story the samaritan woman was the lowest in terms of social respectability you know what i'm talking about in the philippines you have a word for this kind of woman you have a definition for this kind of woman ang babaeng kalapati ang babaeng mababa ang liba how do you translate that in english prostitute that's right you don't talk to those kinds of people. So you've got a lot of things going on here. A lot of things going on here. And Jesus breaks it because of intentionality. He sits there. And then he goes, woman, can I have some of your water? My goodness, that's the fourth strike out. You know why? He doesn't have a, a camel back with him. He doesn't have some kind of a glass container with him while he was hiking. And he was asking for water from a Samaritan woman. That means he is willing to drink from the contaminated cup of a Samaritan. That's a terrible religious no no. You see all things going on here is the breaking of all kinds of conventions because Jesus was going beyond traditional conventions because he was intentional. And, and the Samaritan, why are you even talking to me? Are you color blind? I'm a Samaritan. You're a Jew. We're not supposed to talk to each other. And then Jesus goes, You know, young lady, if you only know the gift of God, that's a title of the sermon. If you only know the gift of God, you will be asking me for water because the water that you are drawing from this well you keep on going to this well because you keep on getting thirsty but the water that i'm about to give you is living water you won't have to go back for this kind of water because it's going to satisfy your soul completely at this point the samaritan woman probably is saying man this is a cool guy such a cool guy he doesn't even know me I bet you if this guy knows who I am, he will not be talking to me. He will probably tell me, hey, what kind of a woman are you? You better shape up first before I give you my freebie. But the woman is thinking, ah, this is a cool guy. I think I like him because you know, he's going to give me free water. So he go, she goes, uh, uh, mister, you know what? I, I like that deal because I'm tired of kind of like hiding from all these people and uh, kind of like making sure that no one is here because they keep on chiding me that's probably going on in her mind and so i'm okay i'm okay i, I like that free dispenser is it osarka or sparkling 
I, I, I think, what, when is the delivery? Because I, 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 I want that beer. You said that you can give me free water. Okay, I'm, I'm down. I'm okay. Give me that water. Give me that water. You know what Jesus said? Again, intentionality. Jesus has something going on here. He was planning things for some incredible turnaround. Jesus said, yeah, I'm going to give you that water, but uh, before I do that, uh, call your husband. And the woman goes, oops. Uh, uh, sir, uh, I don't have a husband. You know what Jesus said? You know you're, you're telling the truth because actually the man that you have now with you is not even your husband. You've got five before him. And, and, and the Samaritan woman goes, whoa. Whoa. Change topic. Uh, I think you're a good teacher. You're a good prophet. But uh, you know, it's a prophet. It ships. She ships. And talks about religion. You know, we are Samaritans. We're Jews. We change topic. <coughs> Uh, you know, we think that the proper place of worship is this mountain. You have your own version. What do you think is right? You know, Jesus is just too kind because he, he, would have, he would have told the woman, Why are you changing the topic? Let's talk about your, your filth in your life. God is never like that. Isn't this incredible? You know, one thing terrible about our culture is this. That's why more and more men are late to propose. Did you, did you get this? There's a phenomenon in this day and age. Millennials are very late to propose. They have girlfriends, but they don't want to marry them yet. You know why? They're scared to death. I just read that. Sociological research. Because here is the deal. In this day and age, you can't expose yourself completely to another person. You know why? Because, get this, if I expose myself to you completely, I'd be in bad shape. So I only expose a part of me. This is evident in Facebook, don't you think so? You only expose the good stuff. And so I expose maybe one half of me. That's even risky. So I expose one half of myself. Look at this beautiful lady here. Okay, I'm going to make myself vulnerable. 50% I will reveal and 50% I will safely hide. And then she will accept it because all I present is 50% good stuff. And I will feel cared for and loved, but silently I know I've only accepted one half. Do you know how sad that is to be loved one half? The scary thing is what if she discovers one half, the other side. She will drop me. That's why, oh, I'm scared. I, I don't know if I'm going to enter that relationship. Let's wait. Let's wait. So they keep on waiting. Now the scary part is this. What if I'm courageous and I say, ah, ah, I'll take the risk. I will give 100% now. I, I, I really want her to be in my life. Oh my goodness, here it is. I'm going to unzip everything now in my life. It's on me. Jesus said, 100%. So I spill it, everything, all God's I'm going to tell him, I won't, I won't dismiss, I, I won't hold back anything. And the bad thing is this, she looks at all the gunk and the mess in my life. <laughs> everything. Because I decided I'm going to spill. And then, she rejects me. What's going to happen? I'm going to walk away and say, forget it. I'm just going to hide. It's not worth it. But that's the story of our life. This is us, people. This is the story of my life. That's why no one wants to commit. However, what if this thing happens? What if there's someone in your life where you go rock bottom, like rock hell. You tell them exactly who you are. Dirt in HD. You tell them exactly who you are, and the person across the table loves you to the sky. 
tells you I love you even more. Come on. No one does that. No human being does that. None. Except one. The man on the cross. Amen. The man on the cross goes, give me your gunk. Give me your worst part. And I promise you one thing. I will love you to the sky. That separates Jesus from anyone else. The perfect human. The perfect God. Who can love you more than him? No one else. That's the pearl of the gospel. Once you have that, aren't you going to be intentional? And so the Samaritan woman goes, my goodness, this woman already knows that I'm a prostitute and he's still offering this Osarka deal. My goodness, this is a different kind of a religion. Did you get this? This is incredible. Only Jesus offers this kind of intentionality because he's the only one who's capable of loving the worst human being. Doesn't care if you're a criminal. Doesn't care if you're a rapist. Doesn't care what your background is. You give him your life, he's going to love you to the sky. <clears throat> Intentional. That's why he was quick to offer what he has to offer. And then he moved to the second thing. International. My goodness. Jesus is a Jew. And he didn't say, I'm a Jew and I'm going to stay with the Jews. Now, the Filipinos are this. We are brown and so we're going to stay with the brown. That's all the way. People, let me just say this. We look like Filipinos here. Yeah, don't run around that. Larry Cortez, I mentioned just got his citizenship and the consul told him, now you're an American young man, you are now free to change your name. So what do you want? You want to change your name? And then he said, for, for a few seconds, he was about to open his mouth and say, yes sir, I want my name changed to Larry Brown. <laughs> and then he, he just recouped me, so no, my dad's going to kill me with this. No, I will stay with Larry Cortez. It's deeply embedded in the DNA. We are so ethnocentric. We are so oriented from where we were. You know, I remember my dear wife when she shared that when I was courting her, her wonderful dad, who means well, I'm not saying it's like my father, you know, who means well, told her, where is Butch Diwa from? And he said, he, he is from Pampanga, Dad. Oh, 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 no, 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 my dear. We are from Bacolod. He is from Pampanga. Bacolod and Pampanga will never make it together. Trust me, my dear. Spare yourself from trouble. Stay away from that Kapampangan. <coughs> That is not even international people. That is just inter-island. <laughs> and already, already, already the barrier is set. So do you get this? I'm going to be very quick on this point. This is the biblical community church. Let me say this. We look more Filipino. This is not a Filipino church. If I'm going to be true, to the gospel of Jesus, I have to be international. It just so happens that I am by orientation Filipino, but I'm an American. But I now know that I'm an American, and I, 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 I just need to know why. Because if, if my social research is correct, this is what it says. Immigrants, for the most part, they are moving to the U.S. for one thing, for greener pastures but with a hidden agenda. The hidden agenda is this. They go to the U.S., although they're immigrants with a tourist <coughs> mindset. They go to the U.S. with a tourist mindset. They go to the United States to get the very best of the United States and to get the juice out of the U.S., earn as much money, send the money to where they actually are from, 
and then hope that the United States runs dry because they're quickly thinking, I can't wait to retire and go back home and hope that the United States dies after I dry it up. Jeremiah 29 is so against that. Jeremiah 29 tells us, bloom where I plant you. If I uprooted you from wherever you came from and took you to Dallas, it's because it's part of my plan. Love the city. Bless the city. Go out and vote for the proper persons in the city and pray for the prosperity of the city. Plant the trees in the city. Do not rape the city. But cry out loud. Do not throw your trash and all the things that kills the city. Pray for the city where I planted you. Intermarry with them. <clears throat> Bless the United States. Pray for it. It's part of my plan. And don't consider it as a tourist spot that I just gave you so that you can milk it down to its dry bones. No. Pray for the city. That gives me something. There's a lot of work to be done in the city where we are in. That's why it is not an accident that I'm an American now. I happen to be Filipino by orientation, but by God's plan, I am part of this great nation. I hope this is not a political speech. This is Jeremiah speaking towards us. I hope you get this is not a Filipino church. And I hope that we be very careful when we sing Tagalog songs here, that there is always a, an English line. And if there's a Korean, that there's a Korean line. That no one gets marginalized here just because you're coming from a different island. May God have mercy set us apart. And I pray for the growing number of internationals in this church. Okay? And I hope they don't look at me as some kind of a Filipino brown skin guy preaching to them. I hope we go beyond that. It just so happens. <clears throat> but I'm not mildly dismissing the fact that, you know, there's something about the Filipinos. We plan really well with other nations. So is that part of God's plan? Now let me laugh. Does Chloe blend well with you? <laughs> Mr. Glenn, does Mommy Irma blend well with you? Very nice. You know, I, I think I, ben, I heard, I heard her name say, I feel so loved by this incredible woman in my life. 24-7. Now tell me if that is not blend of 45 people. No, sorry, sorry. My wife's gonna be upset now. Because that is no that, that's the next one to be. That's actually a coffee brand. You know you have your uh, taster choice. In the Philippines you have blend 45. You know I'm very poor in this, so I am working with that. Erase that one. <laughs> but I hope you get the point. International, Jesus is going international. Amen. That's why we went at the camp. Go, show, bless all. Oh, yes. And so he goes. International with the Samaritan. And the Samaritan goes, sir. You know what? Uh, you're very good. You're a teacher. But uh, you know, we Samaritans, we have the Tahir which is uh, our version of the Messiah. And we are told in Numbers 24, 7, that water shall flow from his buckets. Did you get that? The Samaritans have their own version. And it's taken from Numbers. And it says, water shall flow from the bucket of the Tahem, the Messiah. Isn't this crazy? We can just fast forward and it's moving 
to the story in John chapter 4, and everything is pointing towards the I am the living water. And Jesus said, Lady, 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 you do not need to look any further. I am the Tahir. I am the Messiah. I am the living water. You know, the woman, no training in theology. This is what gets God to do what this woman did. She drops her bucket, forgets about her human thirst, and runs towards this village. Do what? Yeah. The component of the gift of God is you cannot resist, but invite others. Because you found true, refreshing, bubbling water, like no water. She went to her village and she Oh my goodness, she spoke to everyone and said, Come and see! Come! I think, I think I have found the Messiah. She, he, he told me everything about myself. Come for yourself. And why would you listen to a prostitute? <clears throat> why would you listen to a marginalized person in society? But they did. You know what? Because one thing I know, I don't care who you are. I don't know if you're a criminal or what your background is. If I see conviction in you, you better get me. A story told from deep conviction eliminates all background. Do you agree? You know when a person is deep down telling you the truth because it's coming from a central conviction. And the Samaritan have that boldness he invited them, she invited them, the entire village people, people, entire village came and they spoke to Jesus. And here is the plan of the gospel. The entire village was born for Jesus. Oh my goodness. Just, just sitting on a well. You just sat on a well asking for water and your plan is to win the entire village. People, how good is that? Amen. Now, it's not only for Jesus, it's for you. God can't wait for you to have the same experience. Ariana, come up here. Ariana is an unusual, she's not from Samaria. <laughs> and, uh, and who is that dog anyway? Okay, that's, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's my brother's dog. He's in Afghanistan right now. I forgot his name, honestly. <laughs> Your brother is in the army. Uh, Marines. Marine. And, and that one is from <coughs> Afghanistan? No, 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 no. He's in Afghanistan. My brother is in Afghanistan. That's his dog, so. Daniel. That's his name. Daniel. <laughs> Daniel is a dog. Hey. Stefan is my brother's name, just FYI. <laughs> in this concession here. No. I'm not going to waste any time. Do <laughs> you know this uh, young lady here. He's a school teacher, one of the best of GISD. She used not to believe in God. Used to. An atheist. And he fights Christians. One day, just observing an ordinary life, the Lord spoke him. Yes, he has a little story. You have uh, five minutes. In that you can share. Okay, so um. Okay, so about let's see, five months ago, I uh, I called up one of my friends, and I hadn't like really talked to him in a long time because. Like, he was my friend before I became a believer, and he was a very, just really, like, loud atheist, aggressive, you know, angry at God, but doesn't believe in God, and um, just very hurt and suffering a lot, and very political, and just, um, and so as I was just, like, really, like, learning to, learning about the Lord and stuff like that, I just couldn't really hang around him that much, because it just hurts too much, like, for me to share what's going on in my life and then have him say those things. So um, I decided like five months ago to give him a call. And I was like, oh, you know, I'm just gonna give him a call and I'm just gonna share with him like what's going on in my life and what I'm doing. So I call him up and um, and so I tell him like, you know what, this is what I'm learning right now in the Bible and and I'm, I'm gonna try 
trust God with this. I'm going to make some decisions and some changes in my life, and I'm just going to follow through, and and that's that. And so, of course, once I mentioned God, like it kind of opened the discussion about about Jesus, and I can tell you that he was really like hostile towards it. You know, he was already like yelling at me on the phone, like, got this, got that, slavery this, you know, uh, Muslims that, and then war this, and, and then, um, so, so I was like, I, I'm over here like listening to someone like yell at me for what I believe in, and I'm just like, I hear everything he's saying, but it's actually not even that accurate, you know, and I've been studying, I've been taking apologetic courses, and and so I am like, well, okay, I, I already know like where he's coming from, I already know what to say, but he's like, you really just arguing with me at the phone. And I'm like, okay, this has to stop. Like, so, so I tell him, I'm like, okay, like, you know what? You seem like you're a very angry person. Like you're so hurt right now and, and you gotta make a decision in your life. Like, I decided to follow Jesus, and I really do believe, like, the Bible is the Word of God. And, like, it can be proven, and, uh, you know, I believe, like, that's the truth, and the truth never changes. And if you want to do your research, do your research. Like, the truth doesn't change. It's going to be there for you. But it's your decision to make, and then, and that's, like, your decision. It's just your choice. So I get off the phone. And I'm like, I'm like in public, like talking on the phone and stuff like that. And I'm thinking, oh, I messed up. I mean, I, mean, I just was really in like this yelling conversation, this argument. That's not the way to do it. You're supposed to be like a listener and everything. I'm like, oh, yeah, I did not do that right. But like, why, why did I like argue with him on the phone? Why did I? So I thought, man, okay, God, like take care of my friends for me. If it's not through me, I know, like, you'll provide. And so, um, jump forward to now, about a week or two ago, um, I was, like, thinking about my friend again, and I decided, like, hey, you know what, I'm gonna hang out with him. I got, I got my camera with me, my tripod, like, he's a photographer. I'm just gonna call him up, and it was Saturday morning, I'm gonna see if, I'm gonna, we're just gonna go hang out, we're gonna shoot some photographs together. So, it's like, really early in the morning and I wasn't really expecting him to answer, but I call him up and he's like, hey, what's up? And then I was surprised, like he didn't sound like I just woke him. And he's like, hey, you know what? I'm in the middle of something right now. And I'm like, well, what are you, what are you up to? What are you doing? He's like, oh, right now I'm in a Bible study and I've been studying the Bible for the past two weeks every morning. And I'm like thinking, like, I'm just not, I'm speechless. I'm like, <laughs> like my friend is so like aggressive, angry, like loud, like atheist, you know. Everywhere he goes, like that that's who he is, and then he's willingly like doing this on his own, like studying the Bible and looking into it. He's like, right now I'm in the book of James and I'm learning about this and I've been doing these Bible plans on the Bible app and this, this and this and then I'm like thinking wow, like, <laughs> I'm just like, okay, hey, do you want to hang out later? And so we hung out later, and, and so he, like, talking to him, he's like, he is, he is so in love with the Bible now. And um, I call him up later, you know, hang out later, call him. And all the conversations that we have now, like, like that conversation, that very first conversation where it was, like, an argument, and, and like, I was confronting him, like, it has been redeemed. And I've been able to, like, like and he, now he just, like, listens. I share, like, how Christianity, like, Jesus is not like any other religion. Like, how Jesus is, like, unique and special. And he's the truth. And and no other religion has that. And there's fundamental differences. And and, and now he listens. And he's on the Bible app now. And I can, like, see, like, what he's highlighted and what he's studying, what, like, the comments he makes, like, he is so in love with the Bible now, and now when I talk to him on the phone, like it comes up when we discuss things in the Bible, and I know he's in public, and he's a loud guy, and he talks on the phone, so now he's like saying, the Bible is the truth, the Bible is this, like, and the Bible says that, like, it's our basic, and I'm like, wow, this guy's proclaiming the Bible is the truth in public, that is such a major change, so, 
So um, I just wanted to share that with y'all because there was like a moment, not a moment, but a, a moment in my life, like an area of my life where I was a little too like timid to share my faith, especially to the ones that I love the most. Because I, I guess I feared rejection or hostility or maybe they wouldn't be my friend anymore. But um, like I was just so amazed, like in awe, like what? What? So, um, and it really does bring like that life to them. So like my friend, he seems to be doing much better now. And I have another friend too where where like I offered, you know, you know, I offered that Jesus is the answer. He is our Lord and Savior, like he can restore her. You know, I've invited her to things and she's like, oh no, that's not that's not like me for right now. But I talked to her yesterday too. And today, like, she told me, like, hey, I'm going to go to church tomorrow. And I'm like, what? <laughs> so I have, like, I just know, like, God does answer prayers and, like, to share your faith because you could be, like, speaking life and bringing life to others who need you to do that. And in any hostility that you face, um, the Lord redeems and he'll, like, protect you in that. So I just wanted to share that story with y'all. Amen. I don't know about you, that's not joy. I don't know what that is. <clears throat> but uh, here, Priyana's uh, PowerPointing a significant reality about Christians. The joy is, is to be equated with the frequency of your disclosing who you are in Christ. By way of application points, I have very three simple points. Number one, plan to share the gospel with a simple true story. Major in planting little seeds of God stories about you. You don't have to be manipulated. The aggressiveness of the gospel is found in its simplicity. We do not have to manipulate. With the sick, it's not this. I'm right, you're wrong, and I have a lot of fun. That I have a lot of fun telling you that you're wrong. That's not the kind of witnessing that I find in the style of Jesus. Jesus, in the manner by which he ministered to the Samaritan, was engaging, but it was frank, it was honest. And he never hid the fact of the gospel. People don't. How do you become a good witness and a testimony person? Don't hide your Christianity. If you make a commitment not to hide your Christianity, it's game over. You don't be a good witness. Just tell people when they ask where you were on Sunday. Don't tell them. I went to some Sunday game. No, tell them I went to church. Because I worship the Lord. And then they'll ask questions and then just be yourself. Tell them what you're about. <laughs> Share with a simple true story. I think that's what Ariana did. But then the important point is the intentionality. Please intentionally plan. Ask the Lord for opportunities but intentionally plan who the person is, where the location is, and then ask God for joy. We need better songs to him. Second, can you pull up the second one? It says, pursue the nations and do not focus on the limitations of your own preferences, in, in our case, our regions, our nationalities, our race. Uh, we are going viral in Indonesia. Uh, we just introduced a, David introduced a song last week at camp, and there was an Indonesian-based missionary and that song is now. Do you have that 
Do you have that uh, by chance, uh, Alex? No, you can't play that. Yet. Yeah, if you get the chance, look at David Delaget's Facebook post, and you will be so delighted that now this is going viral in Indonesia with the Indonesian accent, of course. Just wonderful. Who soothe the nations with the redemptive motiva motivation. How do you go this? For those of you who are vacationing out of the country, how delightful would this be if you include in your vacation packages English? And you will say, oh, I'm excited. <coughs> what God will open up in terms of me being able to share the story of God in my life to a person abroad? A stranger and leave the matter to God. Remember, it only takes one person on a well, you asking for a drink, and an entire village gets saved. Simple principle. Pursue the nations. Do not let your nationality dictate your your approach. There's a lot of jewels. A lot of jewels international waiting for the, the capture of joy and and, and we are God's uh, appointed missionaries <coughs> and finally <coughs> point your contacts not to yourself but tell them come and see for yourself because I have found the Messiah who told me everything about myself and who knows everything about myself. You see, the running theme of our sermon today is about water and our thirst. Do you know why Jesus is audacious about this? Because he was thirsty on the well right here. But a few moments before he left earth and went home to be with his father, while hanging on the cross, the Lord Jesus, while hanging on the cross, looked at you, looked at the entire world, and with his hands outstretched on the cross of Calvary, he cried out, I thirst. Now I ask you a question. The God of the universe without stress hands, fully God, fully man, he was hanging on the cross, dehydrated people, totally shaking, involuntary spasm, the, the most vicious punishment towards any human being. Perfect man, Jesus, hanging on the cross, and he cries out, I thirst! And what was given to him? Not water, people, vinegar. He was never given any water so that he can get satisfaction from his thirst. You know why? Did you ever ask that question? Why? Why? Why was not he satisfied with a basic asking, with a basic request? Can you please give me water because I thirst? You know why? Because it, it's part of God's plan. Jesus volunteered on the cross. He said, human beings are going to be thirsty. And there's nothing in the world that will keep them satisfied. I'm the only one who can satisfy it. And so in order for them to be fully satisfied, they're quenched. The thirst for them to be quenched. I need to be thirsty and not be satisfied. I will take their thirst away. Jesus hang on the cross for you and for me, brother, to take your thirst away. He was not satisfied on the cross crying, I thirst! That he could not be even given a single drop of water so that you and me can have all the water that we can have. So that he can look at every dirt in our lives and say, I will still give you water because I will love you to the sky. 
because I died for you on the cross. You will thirst no more. He is the living water. You have a savior like that. Will you not tell your village that you have found the Messiah? Come on, people. And the promise is this. You tell your village about the Messiah. The Holy Spirit will shoot up joy after joy in your life. Now, do an inventory. Are you joyous recently? When was the last time that you shared Jesus to another person? That can change today. If you tell God today, forgive me. I have not done my part. No wonder. My joy. It's up and down, up and down. But I want that portion in my door. I want abundance in my life. Give me the opportunities. I will now be brave. I will be intentional. I will be international. And I will be invitational. Just give me that joy of sharing Jesus with a sense of urgency. I'll give you a minute. They will do play. Why do you talk to the Lord? And what what you commit, we approach to him. We joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. I say well three. Stay. 